America from Fox 22. I'm Doug Farnham, Commissioner and Adjutant General for the State of Maine's Department of Defense, Veterans, and Emergency Management. ABC 7 invited me to introduce a very special program, Our Heroes, Their Own Words, which gives Maine's World War II veterans the opportunity to tell their stories. From the European theater to the Pacific, these veterans experienced war that was fought on land, sea, and in the air. It was a war that united our nation under one collective spirit to defeat the Axis stronghold that threatened freedom and democracy around the world. From the attack on Pearl Harbor to the sands of the Normandy beachhead, these brave Americans gave of themselves in a way that few of us could ever fully understand, leaving their education, businesses, and loved ones behind to serve in a far-reaching corners of the world, all for a cause they believed in. These men and women enlisted or were drafted in record numbers and selflessly served their country, asking little in return for giving up years of their lives and having experienced things we can only imagine. Yet they returned home to become the fabric of our communities and our nation. They were our teachers, CEOs, construction workers, and Little League coaches. They were our legislators, city councilors, and school board members. They were our parents and grandparents. Thank you for tuning in to Our Heroes, Their Own Words tonight. I think you will enjoy learning firsthand from the Mainers whose experiences in the Second World War not only changed their lives forever, but allowed us to live freely without repression. And for that, we must always remember the great debt of thanks we owe our World War II veterans. My name is Henry Breton. I'm a World War II veteran. When I went into service, I didn't even speak English because I went to a, a Catholic school. And we live in the French section of Augusta. Nobody spoke English. My mother didn't speak English. And I was called in and then they rejected me because of <clears throat> my trigger finger was gone by then. But I talked them into finding a place for me. I applied for truck driving school and that's what was because my career. My outfit went overseas for, to be in the invasion in France. And they were. They were in the second wave, but I wasn't. I was in the hospital in New Jersey. I joined my outfit four months later. And uh, I was in England with uh, the group. The German broke through the Arden Forest. Uh, so they needed help. So they asked for volunteers. Uh, Volunteers is uh, you, 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 you. That's it. So overnight they flew us in C-47 to Camp Lacker Strike in, in Reims, France. Uh, in 24 hours I was at the, I was at the front. The German broke through right there. So, but uh, I lost my outfit. I was with the 106th Infantry. Six of us went into a headquarters, built a German headquarters that they had taken over. And we were in a wine cellar down in the, in the building. Uh, we couldn't get out because the German were upstairs. And uh, my outfit surrendered, 800 men surrendered and they took their guns away from him. They laid down their gun and they put him in the field and machine guns everybody. They killed every, every American. Six survived and I was one of the six because the six of us were in the wine cellar. They didn't know we were there. And that's the only reason why we survived. We'd have been with, with the rest of the group. It's just by chance. When the American pushed back in and we heard American voices up above, we didn't know, they had told us that uh, some of the Germans are dressing up an American uniform. We said, well, we have to get out of here. All they had to do was open the trap door and throw a grenade in there. 
we'd have been gone. We opened the trap door, and they, of course they put their guns on us, but uh, no, we're, we're American. They sent us in back of the line, and uh, they said they'll, they'll reassign you. I, I thought we were going to our outfit, but I was in the First Army then, and they put us in the Third Army. The six of us were put in the Third Army. I received the Medal of Honor from Luxembourg. That's why I did my fighting. And that's why I was close to General Patton. Every one of us. He was the turning point, and they knew it. They called him from, the, from Metz, France, way down southern part of France. And he drove all the way up to relieve us because the German had broken through in the Ardennes. It took him three days to get up with those tanks. You know, you, tanks don't drive uh, 50 miles an hour. I was supposed to be one of the first one to be discharged uh, after they did the atomic bomb in Japan. Uh, I was due to come home in, I think it was about uh, October or November. The war was over. So I was ready to come home. But then I wanted to get married. I had found a woman over there and I wanted to get married. So we applied for a permit. And they said, well, you're going home. You can go home and then you can come back on your own. I said, no, I'm already here. I'm not going to go home and then come back. I says, what can I do? They said, well, you can sign up for three months at a time so you can stay here. So I was driving for a captain then of a PTT building, which is Postal Telegraph and Telephone. If you want to marry a foreign girl, a European girl, you have to have permission from their parents, from the girl's parents. And if you don't have permission, you have to wait 30 days and your name is posted on every bulletin board in the city for 30 days and anybody can object to that marriage. So she had to leave home. So at midnight one night, uh, she threw her stuff out of the second floor window and I caught it down there. And at 10.30 in the morning, it had to be in front of three judges. They had a reception there for us and I had to be in, uh, in Germany that same day at 6 p.m. to board the ship. My papers were over. So I had to be discharged. So I was, I didn't have a very long time and I didn't hear from her for another month. I didn't know what was happening. But the army took over, and they got her, transferred her to France at the port of embarkation. And she met all the other brides over there from all over Europe, and she bought a ship, a troop ship for back to America. And I had to drive to uh, Germany to board my ship. And the ships were made in Bataille and Work in Maine. I get over there and I said, oh look, there's a sign on the ship. Bataille? I said, that's, that's, that's only 35 miles from my island. When I got to America, I was packing my clothes, getting ready to get discharged. 
And there's a guy that came over, he says, Henry, there's, there's a Walbride ship next to us, upstairs. And the Walbrides are all on the, on the railing. And he said, we're all waving to them. Well, I says, I'll be down. I says, I'll go up. Well, I went up. I waving at them, but I didn't know she was there. So the next morning, we finally I got up and I could get to a phone. I called home. They said, your wife is arriving today. Arriving where? Here. Well, I said, I'll be done. She must have been on that ship. When I went back years later, and they took me to the Siegfried Line at the four corner where I got separated. And I broke down there, but that was the only time. Because it came back to me and all of a sudden, uh, and uh, I freaked out. I never thought that uh, out of the four brothers, I never thought that I did anything special. My oldest brother was in the invasion of North Africa in Catherine Pass. The first one that went was in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor. He lost the legs in Marshall Island. Uh, he came home. I always looked at uh, military as a, an adventure. I think I learned how to live I learned to appreciate life. I learned to respect other people's life. Come stop by Triple S Tag Shop, 315 Hamden Road, Carmel, for quality clothing and equestrian gear. When it comes to winter footwear, warmth, waterproof, and safety matter most. Take the drive today to Comfort Shoes and More in Newport and discover the latest in winter boot technology. We've got boots rated from minus 60 to zero degrees Fahrenheit to keep your feet warm in any weather. Check out the new materials guaranteed to keep your feet dry. Relieve the anxiety of slipping and falling this winter with a new Navitech with grippers built right into the sole. Just flip it and clip it and you're ready to go. Be prepared this winter. Take the drive today to Comfort Shoes and More in Newport. It's about character. It's about belief. Break, break, break! It's about trust. This is not an adventure race. This is a military selection. Do I still have that fire? They've entered our world. They will play by our rules. My name is Florence Amelia Manchester Smith, and I'm a World War II veteran. Well, I was visiting my brother in Massachusetts. He was in the Coast Guard, and uh, one night my sister-in-law had to go and pick him up. And so we were waiting there for him, and I looked at the door, and out comes all these women with those beautiful uniforms on. I think a light bulb went off in my brain because I thought, I think that would be for me. I was just a small town girl and there wasn't much around here, you know, to do or anything. And I thought I just might like to, where it was World War II, that I could do it. And, I, and my brothers were Coast Guardmen and they were also uh, in the Depression. They were in the CCCs, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, so they paved the way for me, and I thought, well, if they were that young and joined that for President Roosevelt, I think probably I could do 
as you could, as they had. I had signed up and enrolled right then, and then I went home and told my mother. But uh, she didn't, uh, she wasn't mad at me or anything. I think she thought, well, I was the only one out of 11 that graduated from high school that I might know what I was doing, I don't know. But uh, I told her what I had done. And uh, she was very proud of me after I did go in and everything, so. But uh, um, I enlisted in November, because uh, that, that was when it was organized, 1943. I had a boyfriend and uh, he was in the Coast Guard. So he came up in December and uh, I had told him what I had done too. And I was at my church doing some things for the kids that I, I was a Sunday school teacher. And in he comes and uh, he, he was so excited, he reached in his pocket and hauled out a ring and I said, no, not now. So I said, you help me with what I'm doing. And then we'll, you know, later we'll go. And so we did, we went back to his grandmother's. She lived in Jonesport too. And, uh, and that's where he gave me my diamond. And, uh, and then I got my orders that I was leaving for Palm Beach in January. So I bid him goodbye and uh, then took off and went to Boston. And on a Thursday at four o'clock, we booted a troop train and uh, started off for, for uh, Palm Beach. And I had never ever been beyond Boston. So everything was so exciting for me, you know. I saw my first palm tree and I didn't even know what that was like, you know, but uh, I was excited, and there was quite a group of us, and uh, and every time we went on went to the dining hall, we had boys there too. Sailors was there on that troop train. They would yell at us and say, "You be sorry." Every time we went to the dining room, so we didn't. I didn't pay any attention to them because I didn't think I'd be sorry, you know, so. And we didn't land in Palm Beach until uh, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And I remember what they gave me. From, it was lunchtime, but we got cereal. <laughs> and then uh, it all went like they do at boot camp, you know. We, uh, we were busy and uh, getting uniforms and everything like that. At the end of the six weeks, uh, that's when they assigned everybody. Well, I happened to be taken sick, and I was in the hospital. So I don't know whether they knew I was where I was or anything, but I had gotten out the day that they were to assign people, waiting for my name to be called, but it wasn't. So I just figured that maybe they didn't know that I was back out of the hospital. So they didn't have any place for me uh, in office work because it was all filled in Palm Beach. So they asked me if I would like to work in the bakery. And I said, yes, I would love it. And for six months, I worked in the bakery at Palm Beach, Florida. And I made many friends and I loved it. And uh, then I got my orders for Boston. And uh, when I went to say goodbye to the commander that was uh, getting me to go, uh, these are the words she said to me. She said, if you do as well as you do in Boston, you will be okay. And that's when I thought people were watching that we didn't even know that they were watching us. And I've told all my grandchildren and great-grandchildren that's what it is, you know. You never know. And they bought my ticket for Boston. And the night before D-Day, I stayed with my brother and his wife. And then the next morning, she took me in to my base in Boston. And that's when we heard that it was D-Day. 
That day, June 6, 1944, is uh, really nice to me. I did office work because I saw the, you know, the signs was uh, enlist as a spy and release a man for duty. So that was the motto, because men were doing all the office work. And then I was a confidential file clerk, and I loved it until I got One morning, I had to go to the custom house with a stack of papers, and I was so surprised when I looked down at that first one on that. It was my brother, Harold, asking for a promotion. But he refused it. But I was so surprised that I would see that the very first thing when I went to the custom house for that. My husband-to-be uh, was stationed in Rockland, Maine. And uh, he came right up to see me because I hadn't seen him for six months. And uh, I said, let's get married. So I told him on July 15, at six o'clock, be at my sister's house. And the night before I left, I came home on, on the train. Uh, and the next morning I got up and I got off the telephone and I uh, invited 100 people to my wedding. And I never thought at all, all day long, where he might be, because I knew we'd be hitchhiking because that's what they did back then, you know, was hitchhike. He finally showed up just before six o'clock. <laughs> and then, of course, I was expecting. So on November 11, 1944, I was discharged. Yeah. I went because I was adventurous and I had never seen anything, you know. And so I just wanted to go and uh, and do my part and see a little bit more than what I had been seeing, so. $7.8 million. That's how much I made home sellers in the past two years. Planning on selling? I'm Holly Taylor. Come to the one, gets it done. HollyTaylor.Realtor. CEM DP Porter Contractors has been in business for over 40 years in the Bangor area. We specialize in design build for commercial, medical, and residential. We can assist our customers with anything from lot procurement to help you find financing for your project, along with building maintenance and renovation. CEM DP Porter Contractors is currently hiring a Herman for multiple positions, including carpenters and laborers. We offer vacation, holidays, a 3% IRA match, and competitive pay. If interested in applying, please contact Jason at 207-848-7486. Why should your new floor come from Carpet One? Because we're passionate about the spaces our neighbors call home. We're part of your community, and we're also part of the world's largest cooperative of independently owned and operated flooring stores. So you can be sure you'll get great selection and outstanding value with every installation. Whether it's carpet, hardwood, tile, or luxury vinyl, our experts take the guesswork out of choosing the right floor. We're your local Carpet One Floor and Home, the one store for your perfect floor. When selling your home, knowing your options can make you tens of thousands of dollars. That's what I do for my clients. I'm Holly Taylor. Come to the one who gets it done. HollyTaylor.Realtor. My name is Bill Cross, and I am a World War II combat veteran. Pearl Harbor uh, was on December 7th. I knew we were going to war then. And so the next day, three or four of my good friends and I went down and volunteered for the service. They kept us in school. Well, another year or two before we went to basic training. My friend and I had a fight for OCS, officer's training, and was accepted. And so we both wanted to be in the armored force. When we went, went over, and we had no protection from either shore. I think I was the only officer that whole on, on the whole boat, and we had a thousand men. Uh, it was a transport, but it was a camouflage as a freighter. I came out in the open, and none of the men were able to come out at all. Submarines would see it, and they would know it was a, a troop ship. 
And at any rate, well, the captain came down, and right about that time, a little, the little ship in front of us went up in flames, and and uh, and the little one in back of us went up in flames. They both were little tankers. And the captain said, "Well, we're going to be next. It'll be here in two minutes." And uh, and he was right. He saw the torpedo coming in, and it hit us right in the middle. Big thump, but no big explosion. And the uh, captain said, "That's a miracle. I never heard of a dead torpedo." But the next one will be here in two minutes. <laughs> And we waited about 15, and finally what the sailor had come down. He said, you, I think that was their last, that was their last one. I think they don't have any more. Because otherwise they'd have been here a long time ago. And uh, uh, so I remember I went down and I got on a loudspeaker and I said, man, I think you just experienced your first miracle of the war. <laughs> And all I could hear was about a thousand whispers of, oh, thank you, God, thank you, thank you so much. When we landed, or when we got over there, General Patton called all the officers together, and in his uh, language or whatever, he said, you can forget all that, all that trade that you, forget, that you learned, you can forget that, because the Germans know just exactly, they have your manual, they know exactly what you were trained to do. And so when you're fired upon, at the time, we were, we were trained to take cover. And he said, and they know that. And so when you get fired upon someplace, get the hell out of there because they had it all already set up. They had it zeroed in with mortars and so forth. And so right after they opened up fire, and I yelled, I was a platoon leader at the time, and I yelled, and I said, get out of here. And so we headed for the woods. And then and sure enough, where we had been, just the whole ground got plowed up. We had adhered to what we'd been trained to do by, by we had been gunners. And so, General Patton saved our life that first, that, that first time that he told us about it, and, and we listened. And so then I was assigned to a uh, infantry division, a you know, tank infantry team. The tankers are the ones who are in charge of uh, the logistics and where they want to go and what they want to do and so on. And so uh, infantry always goes first but, so that you don't have a, a trap set up for the tanks. We were, we're going to cross into Austria where we were supposed to meet the Russians at uh, Scharding, Austria. Why, that was where the main road was. I'd been promoted to a, uh, to a first lieutenant also a uh, company commander, which is 250 men. And then that morning we came in total unexpected, of course, and so we, we captured Scharding with the, not hardly a shot being fired because they were, still, they were still pretty much asleep and the tankers were out of their tanks and everything. So we captured a, an admiral and a general and why they were there, I'll never know, except that they, they had a reputation of incredible red wine, and so maybe the guys had gotten there to get wine. I have no idea at that time of the, of the war, but at any rate, they asked me if I would take those guys back to uh, regimental headquarters for interrogation. And on our way, we came to a, a very, very steep hill, down at the, the very bottom, while you can't see up and you can't see down. But we, got, we, we came under fire before we, we got to that hill. And I could tell they were heavy machine guns and they could penetrate a jeep easy. So I had those two guys kind of handcuffed to the back. We had cleared out all the area, but uh, obviously there was a good force of Germans that was left. If I'd gone up the hill, why, they'd have torn us up. And if I'd turned around and tried to go back, they'd have torn us up. But those heavy machine guns, were, they were like our 50 caliber. So they were uh, very destructive. They could go through a jeep like nothing. And, and I, I knew we couldn't wait until dark because they knew that there's no more than four of us. And that had been nighty night for us, uh, my driver and I. So I, uh, well, I put a, a several magazines around my neck and so forth and I went into the woods and I 
and I crawled up the hill. And then I got in up and, and to, to where I knew I was at top, the top of the hill. I knew I was in back of, of, of the machine guns. And so that I got as close as I could and still had to cover a, a tree. And, and, there, and there, were ten, there were 10 of them. So there are two, two machine guns up there. And that's what's normal is a five, five man uh, crew for a heavy machine gun. And, uh, and then I opened up with my, with my carbine and uh, automatic. And after I used up the first magazine, well, there were about half of them that were kind of down. And, and so, and there were only two of them that were able to recover and find out what was happening and get their rifles and try to shoot back. And but finally, uh, after probably my third magazine, why they were all down. And so I ran to the top of the hill and motioned for my driver to come up. And, and I told him, I said, if you see me, you come up fast. If you don't, why, uh, turn around and go, go back because they're not going to be worried about you. They're going to be worried about me. And I'm not going to make it. So we, we got back and we got out of there. We got to the regiment. And, and then I told him, I said, well, there's a rather large force, I think, of Germans that nobody had cleaned out yet. And I think, I think it was my uh, driver that probably told somebody that it happened. A long time ago, I mean, a lot before that, it was a couple of months, while we were still in France, a couple of boys from Tennessee, they were good friends, and, 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 and they came along and said, Lieutenant, would you like to have us make your carbine automatic? I told him, yeah, that would be a good thing. Yeah, yes, especially if you're in health the house, that'd be a good thing. And so they did. And so that was a miracle, that, I guess, because that was that happened way before. And so somebody knew, I guess, I was gonna need an automatic, because if I hadn't had an automatic, I, it would have never worked. A single shot, would I, I would never gotten out of there alive, certainly, for sure. Now, oh, what's the picture of my wife up there. I carried that steel helmet between my helmet liner and steel helmet. But it's got a nick in it because I had a bullet that went in here that came out the back. <laughs> and uh, and I think it maybe nicked that. And so between God and and her, they, they moved it over maybe one centimeter or two centimeters. And it ended up just catching my, my helmet liner just proper so it glanced a little bit. And so uh, that was, I don't know if that's a miracle or not, but it's, uh, it'd be stretching to say I was lucky. No, I, I wasn't wounded. I got a couple of two purple hearts. And I had a bronze star, but a silver star is when you put your life on the line to either save somebody or to make something happen in the war that needed to, ha need to happen. And if you didn't live to talk about it, <laughs> well, then you got a silver star, and the silver star was sent to your closest of relatives. Uh, but if, did, if you didn't live to talk about it, <laughs> well, it was a broad star. But it was after, well after the war was over with, I received it, but it's, it, was, it was kind of not a, not a big deal. LiftMaster is the number one professionally installed garage door opener. Can alert you if you left it open and let you close it from most anywhere in the world. And where's the best place to get your LiftMaster? From PDQ Door. PDQDoor.com. Welcome to Kings Mountain RC and Hobby Shop in Brewer. And some call me the king. There are RC trucks, cars, crawlers, and parts aplenty. There are planes, metal detectors, and gear galore. I have decreed that all people can book birthday parties with their RC vehicles provided for all. We have indoor and outdoor tracks and crawling courses available. Bring yourself, your family and friends to Kings Mountain RC and Hobby Shop, South Main Street Brewer. 
Come bowl a few games here at Bangor Brewer Bowling Lanes. We're one of the only Candlepin Bowling Alley Centers in Maine. Conveniently located in the heart of Brewer, you always have the opportunity to simply bowl for fun. However, you can also join a league. We have youth leagues, adult and senior leagues. Now don't forget, we also host birthday parties for under $100, and gift certificates are also available. Give us a call right away at 989-3798 to make reservations for your birthday party today. Portal Call in Bucksport is closing its doors after 17 years in business. All inventory is on sale, including Christmas jewelry, pajamas, socks, imports, including Harris Tweed handbags, wallets and purses from Scotland, woolen scarves from Ireland, gloves, alpaca socks, scarves and hats. Also, all fragrance gifts, including Inish fragrances from Ireland, man bar soaps, hand-painted silk scarves, plush toys, sleep hoodies, and so much more. Perfect for Christmas shopping. Portal Call, 69 Main Street, Bucksport. LiftMaster is the number one professionally installed garage door opener. Can alert you if you left it open and let you close it from most anywhere in the world. And where's the best place to get your LiftMaster? From PDQ Door. PDQDoor.com. My name is Arthur Dentremont, and I'm a veteran of World War II. I've been an airplane enthusiast ever since I was a little kid. I built model airplanes. I just couldn't wait to join the Air Corps, which was part of the Army back then. I was on the, almost on the tail end of my high school class because I was so young. Just after I turned 17, I ran down and enlisted. And they had gave me an opportunity to go to college, which they did to all uh, aviation cadets. So I went to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst for six months. A wonderful experience. And uh, when I got out of there, I went on to active duty in Biloxi, Mississippi for my basic training. And it was more Army than it was Air Corps. Bivouacs, uh, marching, shooting, guns, and all those things that go with it. Sleeping outdoors in a tent. Uh, the food was wonderful. You know, so many people hated GI food. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Every week they had what they called a phase, phase one phase, and some phase would be like the bivouac was one week, and shooting the, the uh, rifles was another week. And during that time we had to take all these physical as well as uh, mental tests to qualify for aviation cadet. First of all, I had to pass the aviation cadet test, and uh, there was 228 cadets trying to join that, and 18 of us passed. That was when the war was wound, winding down. And I have since talked to a lot of uh, World War II vets, and uh, they were in the same position, and they took these tests, and uh, you had to have at least a five to qualify. Well, I got all, all nines. So they wanted me to stay on and give the tests. So I said, no, I wanted to go with my class, which we went to Chandler Field in Chandler, Arizona. And uh, because I took typing in high school, he said, you're, you're a clerk for the air orderly room, which I did all the time I was in Arizona. And then guess what? That damn Hitler ended the war. I didn't get to go flying. There were 30,000 of us. They gave us three choices. One, you could stay in the Air Corps as an enlisted man. You could go back and get your two-year college prerequisite, or you could take an honorable discharge with a possibility of recall. But 30,000 took the, dis the uh, retirement. And I still keep in touch with some of those people today. Yeah, wonderful experience, those people. And then I went home and I was retired with a, with a number on my back. It says, if the war breaks out, you're coming back in. Well, it never broke out. My mother had five blue stars on her flag yeah, in her window. We had a big family and I had a war bond taken out of my check every, every month and they sent it home to her. When I was in college, I ran out of money my junior year, and I told her, I said, Mom, I can't go back to college because I'm broke. 
She says, you got money. And she picked up $750 worth of bonds. And that's how I finished college. I went to the University of Maine. I got a degree. I got into pulp and paper manufacturing. I worked for Great Northern Paper Company in my own hometown. And that's when I, I uh, retired. I married in, in 54. We have six children, 10 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. Love of my life. I served from February 44 to November 3rd, 1945. There's nothing better, nothing better. I cry when I read the television stuff about people who hate America, and if they want to name the number one patriot, me. <laughs> He's the first, I'm the second. Go to school, get the right education, and uh, be as patriotic as you can. My name is Franklin A. Dendermont, and I'm a World War II veteran. I worked in a shipyard in, in Portland, a uh, nice, nice little city. And the last job I did, put the uh, fan tail up inside. That was my last job, and I went in the service. And I got drafted close to the end of the war, 43. I just took it. I knew it was coming. All I remember is uh, down in Gadsden, Alabama, riding the horses around. And the cobbles on the street, on the street. I loved it. We flew from Italy into, into France. That's where the ship let me off, in Italy. Oh, my job was to go with an officer and see where our shells landed. Army, PFC, and chemical warfare. And we got shot at, too. <laughs> the shell hit and in my feet and covered me with dirt. I was lucky there. And I flew from Italy to southern France in the glider. We went over the ocean first. Then came in just a little bit left of Nice, and we crash landed there. And we took machine gun fire, and you could hear the p p pellets going through the fabric. Oh yeah, nothing left of it. <laughs> we was in the Patton in France. He led his army heading from Berlin. They come out of the woods, Gefangen, Gefangen. No, that's, that's German for prisoner. I saw him though. Later on, I was riding in a truck. And another one came together, and I said, oh, my arm. It was fashion two places. So they took me to the hospital, and they put a pin there and a pin there, and then they tied them together. And I watched them operate. <laughs> the doctor said, what are you looking at? I said, nothing, sir. Finally, he looked at me, and said, I'll be damned. <laughs> and when I got out of the service, we went down to Bangor and they had horses to rent down there, so it rode again. <laughs> yeah, it was a good, uh, a good, good thing in my life. I went to a prep school and then I went to Wentworth Institute in Boston. And I came back and I worked for him. I was an engineer. When they grind us the wood, they, they put the sticks into a, into a hopper and chewed it all up. And they saved it. And they used it to make, make to print paper. Bank of Dues and Portland Press Herald and uh, Boston Papers. Comfy, cozy, relaxing. Not Joe. Joe's Furniture. Joe's Furniture Warehouse in Newport is the place to find rockers, recliners, sofas, and easy chairs. Quality furniture, affordable prices. Not your average Joe. Joe's Furniture Warehouse, Grogan Avenue in Newport. Hey, it's Eric from Green Bear 420. We've been in business since 2010 and going strong, so stop in and check us out. We specialize in glass art by over 100 local artists and even have live glass blowing. Plus, we carry incense, novelties, t-shirts, and hard-to-find items. We have tons of local products for the tie-dye wearing person in your circle of friends. Come see us at 531 Moosehead Trail in Newport. And remember, Green Bear 420, it's not just a store, it's a lifestyle. From the land to the sea, 
Chase's Family Restaurant is the place to be. Are you looking for a place to unwind after a long day? Then come check out our Hideaway Lounge. With a bar that's both upbeat and laid back. And it's the perfect atmosphere for anyone who wants to unwind after work. Or kick it up for the weekend with daily drink specials and a full dinner menu. You can fill up on a good time any night of the week. Thank you for being a part of our family. Here at Chase's Family Restaurant. Pro football fans, it's You Pick'em NFL, the Pro Football Challenge from Fox 22. Go to foxbangor.com, click on You Pick'em, and go to You Pick'em NFL. Make your picks, and you could be the weekly winner of a gift certificate from Chase's Family Restaurant in Bangor. Brought to you by Chase's Family Restaurant in Bangor. Proudy Auto Body and Dober Foxcroft. Twin City Tile and Brewer and Twin City Tint and Brewer. Compete all season long for the grand prize trip for two to Hawaii. It's You Pick'em NFL at foxbangor.com. Durable, sturdy, stylish. Not Joe. Joe's Furniture. Joe's Furniture Warehouse in Newport is the place to find solid wood, built to last, made in main dressers, bureaus, and nightstands. Not your average Joe. Joe's Furniture Warehouse, Grogan Avenue in Newport. My name is Hazel Marie Hitson Weidman. I'm a World War II veteran. I was a wave in the Navy. My father had been in the submarine service in World War I, and I had two brothers, younger than I, but who were already enlisted in the Navy during World War II, and I wanted to be in the Navy too. So I waited until my 20th birthday with my parents' permission. I enlisted right away on my birthday, but it didn't start serving until a few days later. I went in in 43. I went to boot camp at Hunter College. We had a lot of marching and a lot of drilling, and we had to learn to salute the proper people, and we had to make our bunks properly, and we had to have them inspected. Uh, we had to learn to live in a military environment and to be always constantly aware of hierarchies. When I enlisted, I had been going to night school taking telegraphy with the Morse code, thinking I could probably do, be a radio person. But when we got to boot camp, they gave us uh, aptitude tests, and they said, uh, you would be a good instructor. How would you like to teach Navy pilots how to fly by instruments? And I thought, that would be wonderful. So they sent me to Atlanta for training. I also was short. And when we flew those little planes, I, my legs would not reach the rudder pedals, which was pretty bad. So every time I went out to learn how to fly by the seat of my pants, I had to attach wooden blocks. The, the, the carpenters made me wooden, six inch wooden blocks that I had to bolt to the rudder pedals every time I got in or out. And one time we were practicing a snap roll and one of them fell off. And of course I had to, in a snap roll, you sort of have to pull the nose up a little bit and then you go wham, wham. And then when you come back, you have to uh, work both rudder pedals to get on course again because the poor plane doesn't know which to, <laughs> what you really wanted. So um, at that, when, when I lost one of my uh, extensions, rudder pedal extensions, my instructor had to take over because it flew off and was banging around and those wonderful little yellow perils, they called them. They were fun. They were just wonderful to experiment with in aerobatics. And uh, as you can tell, I enjoyed that. <laughs> I taught instrument flight, radio navigation. We didn't have radar at the time, radio navigation and celestial navigation to Navy pilots. Um, and including the instructors of the, the new recruits. We used the little link trainers, which are uh, hooded. They'd have only the instruments. They would put out a flight pattern that they, that they wanted to pursue. And we would be at the desk being able to feed into their flight pattern turbulence we could give them headwinds, we could give them tailwinds, sidewinds, we could really create problems for them, and they had to uh, manage it all on their own. All of that was being recorded at the desk, so when they came out of the trainer, 
we would go over every step of the way with them and show them what great things they did <laughs> and or where they need a little more practice. Then after they managed it, the instruments, we would go out and accompany them on actual cross-country flights and they would be in the hooded front cockpit and we would be in the back the cockpit watching all the instruments and sometimes we would have to change course because of thunder thunderheads. Sometimes we had to stop and uh, stay overnight at, at uh, other places because of storms in the Louisiana area. It was because I got tired of dating so often <laughs> that I began to spend time in the, in the library. And fortunately, all the bases had libraries with quite a collection of, of uh, interesting uh, volumes. As soon as the war ended, they discharged us. I knew that I wanted a higher education and the GI Bill was passed after I got out. And I thought, well, since I was from a poor family, uh, I thought, well, now I can finally go to college. So I uh, used the GI Bill to be accepted at Northwestern University. And that made all the difference in my whole life and career thereafter. And then I wanted to continue on into graduate studies. Uh, my professor at, at Northwestern said, well, there's only one place for you to go, and that's Harvard's Department of Social Relations. I flew to Cambridge and applied and had to wait uh, until I uh, passed the graduate record examination. But then I was accepted. I think everyone is a trailblazer in his, in her, his or her own way because if they, if they follow their hearts and they, if they follow their, their talents and, and they do what they're able to do, they're, we're, we're all, in a sense, trailblazers, I think. Don't cry, don't whine. Get yours where I got mine. At BB's Tattoo Company, 262 Moosehead Trail, Newport. One good guess. Cursed romance. Star-crossed lovers. <laughs> you better work! Deserves another. Opposite water? Sand. 25 words or less. You're going home with another $10,000. Weekdays at 9 on Fox 22. My name is Lester O'Dellano, and I'm a World War II veteran. I was born and brought up. My father didn't smoke, he didn't drink. I was born and brought up on that farm, and then to the island service. I had two brothers, one younger was stationed in France, and the other was in Alaska. They knew that I was going to be drafted, I was just the right age. They said, if you if you join it, join on your own, you go into the service you want to take. But if it's after, you're going to go over and put you. I went to the Air Force, so I volunteered. And within uh, the 41, they sent me to Fort Devil's Mass. From there, they sent me right down to a radio school. So the film was cold. And they sent me to uh, get in get the school. You had to be able to put a machine on, take it apart in the dark and put it back together again. That'd be a little blindfold. I was a radio operator and a waste gunner. I was overseas two years and nine months over in North Africa in the Mediterranean Theater. I was, I was a tech sergeant. One, one more little step I'd been stopped. I was in the uh, 12 Palm Group, a second squadron. The 12 Palm Group had gone all over by boat and get into uh, Cairo. We were stationed right on the mouth of the Suez Canal, stationed right there, seven miles from Cairo. I uh, went to Cairo quite often and wanted to. But I was lucky. Good Lord, look it over for me. 55 missions. They said, you get all 50 missions. They mission every day until you get 50 missions. They get 50 missions. We don't have replacements for you, so you get your five more. So 
I had your five more. I had 55 altogether. Of course, I was young and single and, and uh, didn't, didn't know I'd be scared of you. So I was scared of you because I, I didn't like your fights when you were out and those bombs. Like the German had a lot of anti aircraft, all the anti aircraft fire. In my last mission, they put 37 holes in our plane. And nobody in the plane got hit. The right engine got on fire. And the pilot could get the right engine out. So you prepared to bail out right over the country I didn't see. I couldn't even swim. I ran to me, got back to base, all right. The Lord looking out for me, that's all I say. 37 holes. I kept that flag waving for four, five years there. It a lot to be in all that. She driven it, tried to take over the world. Hitler wanted to take over the world. So we stopped Hitler. And, uh, and stopping him, we, we ended World War II. After the battle of the service, I lived in, in the Red Town, the Father Little House. I married my sweetheart to get her. 72 years. Lee was the best seed potatoes to say to me. So we got a price for potatoes. We were raising 85 acres of seed potatoes at one time. Probably the country we live in. Well, I'm very fortunate to be living in the United States, so I'll tell you. The other place was out to go. I was like my lucky, lucky guy, so very lucky. I'm Earl Ronnie Howard Jr. I'm a World War II veteran. They drafted me. I was going down to get my license to get married. I thought I was running around too much. I worked on my father's farm. I went right in the service just a few days after that. Of course, I was in the Army. I was a private first class. Drove a big truck. We went in Mitchell Stadt and I went to Osberg and I went to I went to Garmisch even before I came home. In the military I went and got the gas and the wood and the food and there's three apartments for us and, and I, I all stuffed with all of them. Sometimes there'd be a German, and I'd stop and ask him how to get to a certain place. He'd tell me, but he'd tell me wrong every time. And I found that out in a hurry. And so he, uh, you come to these towns, and you come into where they've been bombed. And of course, I was a truck driver, and I once supposed to go only about 45. And the lieutenant would chase me sometimes. I'd coast down some of them hills, and I, I might be going a little bit too fast, but I thought he was going to say something to me. He stopped and talked to me once, but I had the mess sergeant right with me that time. It was unreal. We went underground. I didn't know what it was at first, but it was a airplane shop on building and the plank, a thick plank, cracks in it. You look down through and there's probably four or five flights under you. And I'm telling you that that was about the scariest thing I didn't like. But I came home forty six and uh, they sent my discharge to me right at my house. I, I didn't have to go to New York.